Bells call. Oh, uh, David Clendon. Go on, Mr. Speaker. Kia ora Mr. Speaker, the Minister in his opening remarks quite rightly um, pointed to the fact that the Greens will support this bill to select committee. And that's a decision we made just, um, after some considerable um, thought, and uh, it's a, it was quite a finely judged decision, I'd have to say. And we are committed to supporting this to select committee because there are some, some good and positive steps proposed in this bill. It is, however, a significantly uh, it's a curate's egg of a bill. It's excellent in parts, but equally some very unsavoury elements that we would need to see excised, um, amended, added to in order for our, for our support to go beyond the select committee stage. So we have long acknowledged that there is a considerable gap in our legislative and our regulatory um, frameworks to the extent that, for example, there is no requirement currently for any environmental impact assessment for activities that seek to exploit the seabed in the exclusive economic zone. The current regime, of course, the RMA covers matters out to the, the, the territorial sea, but beyond that, other than the legislation around shipping, around navigation, around fishing, there's actually there is a significant gap in our legislative framework for a whole host of historic and other reasons we won't um, undertake to encompass here. But so we do see considerable value, for example, in the, uh, in the establishment of a legislative framework. We are fortunate, and indeed I'm sure the Minister will acknowledge we are fortunate in having a very substantive um, independent paper prepared by the Environmental Defence Society and published earlier this year under the title Governing Our Oceans. And there are a number of recommendations from that paper that we would wholeheartedly endorse. Not least of those is the call for a Royal Commission of Inquiry to undertake a, a comprehensive review of all of the existing mechanisms of uh, international best practice, the current legislative framework, including the territorial sea, the EEZ and the continental shelf. Because for reasons of history and convenience, we, we have and we do treat those as separate and distinct. But in a sense, uh, physically and certainly ecologically, we are talking about a continuum. There are no bright lines between those three zones. And we think that any management framework, any legislative, legislative framework, needs to acknowledge that the, the separations are actually matters of convenience, not reality. We entirely support the necessity of giving a level of environmental protection to the EEZ sooner rather than later, as the EEZ has indicated. And so we support in principle the, the establishment of some governance prior to that, that more comprehensive review inquiry being undertaken. We do, as I say, though, have serious reservations about some of the content of this bill, and some of the attitudes and the assumptions that underpin it, and some of the absences, some of, the, some of what it's lacking from the bill. We are particularly concerned to see the emergence once again of this word balance, which we've come to understand as um, a coded word, shall we say, a, a, an unwillingness to engage with the notion of absolute environmental bottom lines. And we must insist on some absolute environmental bottom lines if we are genuinely interested in environmental protection. Following and anyone who has read the government's recently released energy strategy will know that in terms of this so-called balance, the government would clearly express a preference and view would tilt the balance, if you like, in favour of economic development, uh, which is designed to attract foreign investment and, we are told, potentially will generate a 13, 14, 15 billion dollar bonanza. Uh, subsection, uh, indeed, section 61 of the bill, um, I'm sorry, section 60 of the bill, it talks about the necessity for the EPA, they may grant an application if the activity's contribution to the New Zealand's economic development outweighs the activity's adverse effects on the environment. Anyone persuaded by that shimmer, that illusion of a $14, $15 billion bonanza awaiting us in resources in the seabed might be persuaded to ignore the very real and, and envir uh, environmental and indeed social dangers and cost. It is notoriously difficult to do any sensible assessment of what is the potential value of a resource exploitation. It is equally difficult to put 
figures to put some sort of value on environmental quality, environmental protection. And these are some of the issues that this bill, I would say, avoids rather than engages with. A recent Cabinet paper pointed out that uh, part of the reason for this bill is that the industry, the exploration industry, is concerned about a lack of certainty in a a regulatory process that could affect their considerable long-term investment. Um, There's a point made that the reputational risk to companies that cannot demonstrate compliance with high um, environmental standards, again, could um, compromise their willingness to invest or indeed their, uh, their their willingness to participate. Accepting that there might be a legitimate concern, I would suggest those companies should be careful of what they wish for, because given that we are talking about what the industry internationally refers to as frontier areas, given the extraordinarily high risk and the various dubious uh, assessments of environmental or economic return, any organisation that was genuinely committed to long-term environmental protection would have no choice but to deny or to refuse any of the sorts of, of exploitation and deep water drilling and the like that might otherwise be mandated. The Environmental Protection Agency was established against the um, opposition of the Greens because it is not an independent agency. It is a Crown entity for purposes of Section 70, a Crown agency, I'm sorry, of the Crown Entities Act, and as such is um, subject to direction by the Minister. And we do acknowledge that Section 22 of this Bill seeks to remove the ministerial um, option of directing the agency, the authority, to fulfil a government policy one way or another, and that is a, um, a provision we can applaud. But unfortunately, any good intention of that section is seriously undermined by section 62.4 that denies the agency the right to impose any conditions on a consent approval which have previously been prohibited or vetoed by regulation. In other words, it's allowing the Minister a back door to ensure that the EPA cannot give... um, that it's constrained in what conditions it might place on consents, as I say, which effectively undermines the apparent good intention. Rather than taking this very convoluted approach to giving a little bit of power to the EPA and then seeking to limit its powers, we would challenge the Minister to actually assign the status to the... to, to, to assign a higher status of an independent Crown entity to the EPA, as he has indicated he might do in a speech earlier this year. That would clearly give the EPA the mandate, the authority that an organisation absolutely needs if it's to fulfil its role under this proposed legislation. We are told the EPA will monitor compliance and will be responsible for enforcement. My question is, where within the EPA currently does it have the capacity to do that? An offshore drilling rig, for example, in deep water... I would be surprised if the EPA inspectors, if we had any, would get access to that site through any other means but the the good officers basically hitching a ride with the oil company, which would suggest that, in practice, it would be very difficult for the EPA, as it currently exists, to do any sensible management, um, monitoring of compliance or enforcement of anything that might come under this bill. The... Bill talks at some length about a cautious approach. It encompasses effectively precautionary principle without actually using those words. And that is an interesting... um, Again, it almost seems to avoid coming to grips with the precautionary principle, which is a well-acknowledged, a well-proven... It's something which has some traction nationally and internationally as a concept and as an application of that concept. And we wonder why such... um, why there's been an attempt simply to talk about taking a cautious approach to decision-making rather than being more explicit about applying the precautionary principle. The matters to be taken into account by the EPA include a whole host of things such as protection of biological diversity, protection of rare and vulnerable ecosystems. My final comments would be that the EPA, in order to fulfil this proposed role would need a remarkably better understanding body of knowledge about the deep water marine environment. We know very little about this. This bill does not address that. We look forward to further debate on it. Kia ora. Cool.